question. She asked um, what was basically the turning point for us as trainers, you know, to make that decision to leave. You know, I started in 93, and uh, I've been in Texas and California and also Kilo facility in the south of France. And I think for all of us, it's a process. You know, it takes you years to get to the point where you make that decision where you can finally leave. And along that way, you see things and there's conflict, but you're definitely not ready yet to leave. It takes a, it takes a long time. It's very difficult. I mean, even once you get to the point where you're like, I don't agree with this, you feel like now you're the person that's the voice for those whales. Who else is going to fight for this animal and stand up against corporate and say, no, I don't, agree, I don't agree with that. You know, that's not the best interest of the animal. So that keeps you there years more, you know. And for me personally, the turning point was when Dawn was killed and um, they said that she was uh, too complacent, that she put herself in too vulnerable of a position. For me, that was just disgusting because I knew Dawn personally and uh, she wasn't breaking any protocols and she was interacting with Tilikum the way that she was allowed to work with Tilikum and all the trainers who were on Tilikum's close contact team were allowed to work. So she was not doing anything wrong and that's you know straight out of testimony from Kelly Clark at the trial. So and then when SeaWorld went on to testify under oath that um, you know they had no knowledge that it was inherently dangerous for us to work with the whales. And, uh, you know, yeah, and, you know, they're, by their own internal documents, it proves that it's a very dangerous job. So that, for me, was the turning point. Uh, I was like, these, this company that I believed would always stand by me and protect me, because I did believe that up until Don was killed, it, it just showed me that they wouldn't. Um, I took my kids to SeaWorld uh, before making this film. So I didn't come from any animal activism. My entry point into this film, into making this film, was uh, Don Brancho being killed. And that's sort of, you know, kind of almost hard, hard for me to admit almost because it, it, it was a sensationalized moment. And uh, for me it was, you know, it was very scary, very bizarre. And there had to be something else to the story. Um, I describe it as, you know, you hear about pit bulls, um, you know, mauling other people. You don't often hear about a pit bull mauling its master. And so in my mind, why this intelligent animal bite the hand that feeds it? Um, that was my, I came in with that question. And I actually thought I was going to be making a completely different kind of film about human beings and their animal counterparts and, you know, just kind of a larger, grander theme, listening to all the different voices when I entered into this and started sort of peeling back the onion, um, I just realized this story's taking me. Um, and the evidence and everything I was learning was sort of guiding me. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting kind of filmmaking process. And I think in terms of my greatest challenge, you know, I would say it would be two. The first one being self-discipline. Um, the more you learn, the more you want to sort of shoehorn all these facts in the film just to sort of give you all the same experience I had when I was making it, you know, the shock, uh, some, you know, facts about whales that, you know, the public should know or whatever. And so I would have to stop myself from doing that. It's too easy um, to editorialize something like this. Um, I sort of wanted to keep my focus on kind of pulling back the curtain and just showing you what I learned in two years in 83 minutes, but really staying with that story you know, the story of, of Tilikum, and, uh, and the story essentially of, of my trainers and sort of the apostles <laughs> delivering us the message from the other side. So those were my two trajectories, and I stayed with that um, as much as I wanted to go off and veer into this, you know, whale captivity world. Um, I had a story to tell, and that's sort of my responsibility is to tell it truthfully. Um, so that was my first, the, the second biggest challenge was, um, I think, just dealing with that. You know, I mean, as much as I wanted Dawn's family to be part of this, um, you know, they declined. I've got a couple interviews in there, but really, you know, for the most part, they declined to sort of lend their voice so that, you know, Dawn's soul is not represented in this film. 
just doesn't speak for the family. And it was one of those things that you learn. I think a lot of Dr. Mayer filmmakers in here probably learned the same lessons. And that is um, sometimes jumping back into the story of why your loved one was killed is kind of the opposite of, of healing. You know, actually we think it's really great that they, they, be, they should know the truth when in fact what they're focused on is sort of focusing on the charity work and not allowing kind of Dawn to be defined by this one incident. So that was a hard one for me because I was like, but no, we got, you know, don't you want to be part of this? And um, I want to know Dawn. I want to feel her up here, you know, when you're watching it. And I kind of want to understand what it was like for her, loving her job and all that. Um, and, and they just said we could never speak for Dawn. And the only thing we know are two things, and that is one, she would want her colleagues to be safe. <coughs> two, she loved those whales. So that's all I know about that. But that was a challenge for me because, you know, um, I, I could never break through that. Yeah, back here. There's two stories, stories of abuse to the animals and stories of, of treatment of the dangers to the, to the trainers. And OSHA stood up for the trainers as the first step of this. Are there institutions that are specifically working to eliminate uh, captivity of whales? PETA or Humane Society and so forth? A ton. <laughs> A lot, I think, and I've just started learning about them. You know, I'm still a student of this whole issue, um, but yeah, sure. I, you might have been aware last year, PETA fired, filed a lawsuit on behalf of the five captive killer whales in the SeaWorld parks that were wild caught. So there are five whales. It was um, Katina, Corky, Tisatka, Ulysses, and Tilikum. All of those whales were captured from the wild and they're still alive in the SeaWorld collection. So they fired, filed a lawsuit based on the 13th Amendment, which prohibits slavery. The idea being that, that the whales were living in the conditions of slavery. Unfortunately, that, whale, that, um, that lawsuit didn't make it very far. The judge actually commended PETA for their actions, but what the ruling was is that because the whales didn't have non-human personhood, then they couldn't actually be, they were still basically possessions. So that, that lawsuit didn't make it, but there is a, a project going on right now, and you can Google it, it's called the Non-Human Rights Project. It's Stephen Wise, he's a lawyer, and he's been putting in thousands upon thousands of hours looking at uh, places to file a lawsuit all over the country with one particular animal to try to get that animal non-human personhood. And once you have personhood, non-human personhood, then you basically have a basket into which you can put rights. So that has to be the first step. As far, and he, Stephen Wise has been working on um, animal rights for probably over 30 years, maybe close to 40 years. So he knows what he's doing. And they are planning to file sometime this year. I don't know what animal they'll be picking, but I know they've been looking at either an orca or an elephant, possibly a parrot or a chimp. All of the animals that exhibit the signs of intelligence that we recognize as humans, very social, um, you know, very intelligent, you know, also long, long range. So, so there, is, there are a lot of things in the works, and you can definitely find those on the internet. Yeah, I tried out, the question was about the folks who were, you know, victims of attacks um, and how, whether or not I got a hold of them. I um, tried, every single one. So whether they settled out of court and just can't talk to me or whether they just don't want to drudge off the past, I have no idea, but I was, um, you know, I was not able to get anybody to speak um, on camera about what happened to them. Yeah, um, it's a really beautiful film. It's tough to watch, but I appreciate what you what you did. Um, my question was for the trainers. The very opening one of the opening scenes was really tough to watch. The you know taking the whales, baby whales and stuff. As if, if you had seen that like as a kid or other trainers seen that as a kid, you think that you still have this. And I hope this doesn't come out the wrong way. Like you think you have this grand idea of going and doing this job, and would it be? You know, this would it have had the same impact on you um, beforehand. And I don't know if, if you've talked about that with other trainers before. Are we going to read the question? Actually? The question was whether the, the capture scene in the beginning, the Pen Cove scene where all the whales are being captured, had the trainers seen that um, earlier on in their careers, would that have affected their decision to stay at SeaWorld? So we just did a screening yesterday for high school students in Salt Lake City, and several of the students came up to me and said, you know what, before I saw this video, I wanted, or before I saw this movie, I wanted to be a whale trainer at SeaWorld. I wanted to work with whales, and that was the only way I could think of to work with whales. 
And so several of them came up to me, and I'm sure they came up to John, and they said, since I've seen this, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. What can I do? And we talked to them about being marine biology majors or scientists or what other kinds of careers there are working with marine biology, ocean conservation. I think the message that SeaWorld wants people to get when they go to the park that they are the experts in killer whales and that's the only way you can work with a killer whale up close. But you can see Dr. David Duffus in the movie and he's been working with killer whales for a very long time and it's not, he's not exploiting them and he's not, you know, they're not having to perform for fish every, you know, seven shows a day. So I can tell you that I wish I had seen this film when I was, you know, a high school student and I never, when, you, when that whale comes out of the water when the baby whale's in the sling, and, um, and you're hearing the story about the diver who was just breaking down but still doing his job. I don't see a whale, I see a four-year-old being ripped from its mom's arms. And, that's, and I can't shake that image. And if I, know, if I had known, so many of the animals that I worked with, that I was close with while I was there, had been in the wild shortly before I got there. And I had no idea, I didn't understand. And, and now that I do, I mean, all of us you know, we've experienced revulsion and embarrassment, and I wish I had never done it. And yes, if I'd seen this, there's, there's no way. And you know, my career was over a 19 year period and I've never seen that footage. So in this film was the first time. And I mean, clearly I knew that they were captured. I mean, as we would say in SeaWorld terms, collected. You know, we had those catchphrases. But you know, I did, when I was a kid, we didn't really have access to that information. And even when I started as a 20 year old in 93, I mean, it was still, you know, before the internet and all that kind of stuff. But also as a trainer in the beginning, you don't really want to know those things. You know, you do kind of push it out of your mind, and I think what's so great about this film, especially today, in 2013, people have evolved. People are ready for this type of information. These are the facts. SeaWorld can no longer, you know, 100% control the information that's out there. Now, you know, people can get that, you know, that information on their own, so. But it was disturbing for me to watch it, you know? I just, I hate looking at it.